Hi, I'm David Coulthard and welcome to Heineken's Non-Race Sundays. Well, joining me today is a former teammate, a current buddy. When I say current, I hope that lasts a lifetime, but a legend of the sport. And he's joining us in F1 Unscripted. It's Mark Webber. Good day. Good day, DC, mate. Weekend off for all of us. Um, yeah. Happy to be here, mate. Unscripted. Indeed. We're, we're, never, we're never scripted, buddy, are we? We're never, we're no, never no, we freestyle in the car, out of the car. And, it, and this little chat we're doing here. So uh, a weekend off. I know what you do now on race weekends because we work together on British uh, television for Channel 4. But what does a weekend off look like for you? A weekend off, mate, is generally, uh, as you know, I love my dogs, running in the forest probably, a bit of, uh, bit of motorbiking as well, a um, little bit of fitness, barbecue with friends, uh, whatever, and probably sinking a few Heinekens while we're at it, mate. So uh, family, friends and fun. Excellent. Well, we love that. So if we can just take you back and we, if we assume that some of the viewers of this don't know your journey from uh, New South, South Wales, and I always pronounce the name wrong. I say Queenieberry, but it's Queen, <laughs> Queen Bian. Queen Bian. Yeah, Queen Bian, yeah. So, okay. uh, so what's the journey from Queen Bian? How on earth? And this is what I love about Formula One. It, it reaches all corners of the globe and it reaches out to to young racers, men and women, and inspires them. So what was the inspiration? What was the early journey bringing you to the UK to uh, continue your journey towards Formula One? Well, probably similar to yourself, mate. It, it started with my father, um, you know, being addicted to Formula One and single-seater racing in particular. Uh, he wasn't overly excited about touring cars. He always thought that was taxi racing. So he said, real men drive single-seaters, and it's real precision, and it's real... Um, I suppose a gladiatorial component for him. He used to hitchhike from Queen Bean up to Sydney to watch the, the, the Tasman series with Jimmy Clark, Jackie Stewart, Graham Hill and um, Jack Bradman, those guys, I suppose, in the in the 60s and 70s. So my father was very pivotal in, in me having the passion towards uh, motorsport and riding motorbikes at a young age. My dad had a, a motorbike dealership, so I had exposure to to petrol and engines uh, from five or six years of age and then got into go-karts around about uh, 12 and 13. So I remember getting auto sport, buddy, and seeing – that was two weeks late for me. By the time I got to bloody Queanbeyan in Australia, that was two weeks after the races that actually taken place because there was a thing called the internet which came out later on where you could follow your results a lot quicker than you know, yeah. having a two-week lag. But, um, mate, I used to love looking through the results. Of course, these tracks, the, the heroes, and, and also the time difference of following Grand Prix racing um, through the mid-'80s there with Prost, PK, Santa Mansell – um, for me, it was 2 o'clock in the morning, but I was religious. I'd go to bed early, set my alarm, try and get back up. And my dad would snore all the way through the Grand Prix, but I would watch every single um, bloody minute of those races and then get up and go to school the next day. Uh, Adelaide also was important, buddy. I think we drove 16 hours, you know, one way from my house to watch the Adelaide Grand Prix, see you do your stuff. I was racing Formula Ford at the time there. Um, so I think having a Grand Prix on our local shores was a huge um, you know, great medicine for me to be able to believe this dream was something that was 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 possible, even though clearly it was delusional at the time getting from Australia to Europe to to try and hit this Formula One goal. But I think having an event in Australia also fueled that fire for me to have the opportunity to to even tr attempt this crazy idea. Those sort of formative years, you were very well prepared for the opportunity for Formula One, and that came in the shape of Minardi, which had been a good feeder team to bring in some other, you know, very notable drivers. Um, you know, uh, Fernando Alonso uh, jumps to, to my mind. Uh, how was that really the, the, the Australian connection with Paul Stoddart that led you into that opportunity? And then, of course, that first point scoring uh, situation in Australia for them and for yourself. And I remember seeing you after the main podium, being up on the podium, celebrating and the Australian crowd falling in love with you. Uh, yeah, well, it was really a b bizarre sequence of events around that. The back end of the 2001 season, I'd done very well in Formula 3000, the step below Formula 1, as you know, DC. And I was, you know, looking to, I'd done some test driving for Benetton at the time, but trying to get onto the grid with a, with a full-time seat, is, as you know, is, you know, that's a huge challenge for, for, for any driver. And um, at the time, Paul Stoddart, as you know, was owning the, the Minardi Formula 1 team. The first race of the season was in Melbourne. And I thought at the time, well, the promoter of the Grand Prix down there was Ron Walker at the time, who you remember Ron very well, DC. He was he was behind. He was in the corner. He was in Bernie's ear. He was in Paul's ear, Stoddy's ear, to say, 
why can't we give him at least a crack in Minardi for the first few races? And my first contract was actually two Grand Prix. My, it was a two-race contract. And I was going down there in, in as you know, the very, very humble team, the, the worst team on the grid on paper in terms of finance, in terms of size, in terms of performance from the car and the engine. Everything was you know, vastly superior to what was at the front of the grid. But it was an opportunity, and I and I took that with both hands. And and the race was wild to say the least all day long, mate. I do not know how that race was not red flagged. I mean, I mean, you were in that race. It took out most. Of, did you survive that first corner, mate? No three. I can't remember what did you. I can't remember exactly what happened to everyone. But I know Ralph. Schumann, I don't I remember. I think I survived. Yeah. <laughs> I know you've won the race plenty of times down there, so podiums always aren't easy to remember after you've had victories there. But I. The crash was huge with Ralph Schumacher took, as I say, half the field out. And they kept the race alive. And I'm like, game on. There's going to be some big attrition here. So this car, I'd only done 17 laps in one hit before in Valencia. And this, this car was never going to finish this Grand Prix. I thought, how is it going to survive? And here's the footage with Mika Salo, who arrived on me late with a few laps to go with a, a superior car advantage. And I'm just like, there's no way you're coming past me. Absolutely no <laughs> way. I'm going to take this little black baby as wide as I can and <laughs> let it stress you out. So uh, ultimately, um, there was some actually some radiator coolants down at turn three, which had been there for the whole race. I think it was from Jensen's car because he got nailed at the first corner. And the coolant just was there for the whole Grand Prix and, and none of us could go there. Um, unbelievably, it didn't seem to be drying out down there. So, you know, here's Salo through turn one, and he tried to attack me down into turn three down here. And I thought if I send him the long way around, he might have a look at that coolant. And um, sure enough, um, he turned in a bit later there as I sort of defended the inside. And then look at that sun, <laughs> round he goes, beautiful. So uh, <laughs> that was that was poetry in my mirrors. And uh, look at the coolant; you can see the track was still extremely slippery on the outside. And um yeah and then the study said look mate you can drive for the rest of the year the funding is now sorted for us in terms of how the contracts work with f1 as you know dc the points and their study there um it was a huge day it was a packed house could not apps couldn't believe it it was absolutely my first grand prix you know and and then look at it you know there's a few people a bit of social distancing there mate there's Ron, <laughs> the guy, inspiring um inspire the situation for me to get that drive and I was embarrassed to be honest mate to be on the podium there that was very embarrassing I'm like you know I don't I want to be here in my own merit to get a top three one day but they dragged me up there and uh that was a big day mate that was uh that was uh yeah a long time ago now 18 years and um freshly shaven there mate look at that I've yeah. no idea what I'm no idea what I'm doing but I'm up there if I jump forward somewhat to your Williams times and your first mm. proper podium you did it in a place that sorts out yeah. the men from the boys, Monte Carlo for Williams, and uh, that was 2005. Uh, memories of that? Uh, yeah, it was a slightly frustrating podium, actually, DC, because I thought that, I mean, and I do know this, this is an absolute fact. I had totally the measure, and Nick Hydefield will confirm this, I had totally the measure of him easily all weekend, out qualified and sort of out out sort of position him in the race with fuel and all the rest of it. We just got in this traffic jam behind Fernando who was running out of tyres. And and all day long, I'm like, you know, there's no way that I could be out strategized here with uh, with Nick, who was then uh, finally arrived onto the back of the queue. And for some reason, they, they pitted him before me. Um, and yeah, he sort of undercut me, which was, I wasn't overly uh, happy with that by the time I got back out. Um, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't, as you know, my track positions, everything there. So, so Nick got second, I got third, I think um, Kimmy won. Um, and it was a yeah, bittersweet first podium, to be honest, because I felt that I, I didn't. Um, there was certainly more on the table that day in terms of uh, strategy. Uh, but look, I think the guys were, yeah, there's Kimmy uh, and Nick. But um, I was, yeah, not, you know, I was all right, mate. But I knew I had unfinished business. And, um, and uh, thankfully, mate, you taught me how to drive around that track when we were teammates later on in my life. So um, I got some I had better feelings and better emotions uh, getting to the middle step there uh, in, better, in better, better days in the future. Yeah, well, uh, just maybe this is a moment to touch on teammates. I don't want to put a, a downer on our time together. But, you know, being in a situation, and you mentioned there about your, your in that case, Hydefield, getting the undercut, coming in earlier and getting the advantage. And you could see in your face on the podium that, you know, you're happy, but you're confused as to, to what's going on. If I jump forward to, to when we were racing in China together, uh, it was one of those transitional races. Tires were at different points in the race and you were on a different different phase coming on the back of me. And I was just outside the points behind, I think it was... Uh, 
uh, Kovalainen and the team asked me to, to not get in your way, but I was so focused yeah. on believing I could get a point. That's exactly what I did was get in your way. Look, mate, I'm, you know, we're, we're cut from the same cloth, mate. I think that, you know, you and I have, our friendship's gone from strength to strength, clearly, you know, post-career. And I think that at the time, you know, we were teammates for a year, which which we enjoyed. And I learned a tremendous amount off you, but that day did, you know, clearly piss me off um, in terms of, uh, it was it was a frustrating, a frustrating day, but that's what happens. You know, like we, we sorted it out, we moved on and, um, you know, people from the outside, I think it's hard for them to understand the micro situations can brew into a scenario when the adrenaline is high and you put a huge amount of effort into a Grand Prix to get everything right. And you've been on both sides of the coin, you mate, as we both have. But it's, 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 you can see that sometimes the radio, the, 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 the lack of composure and the way you're going to deal with the situation, you get very selfish, of course. And we are obviously pretty selfish beasts when we've got our helmets on, but, um, yeah, it's testing times that you know every now and again. But um, we got through it, buddy. We got through it, mate. We did indeed, and uh, all part of the of life's great journey. Just staying on that theme of testing times, and uh, someone who would become your teammate, Sebastian Vettel. Uh, we had a situation in Fuji where uh, 2007 uh, there was a safety car scenario. It was a horrible race, rain, which is so difficult to see anything in those conditions. Yeah, you got but- a podium. You ended up on the podium that day. Did you get a podium or fourth? Or you went, you went all right, I think, in the end. I, I, as, if I recall, I think I crashed at turn one. But anyway, no, I, I did. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, oh, so you, your memory is oh, better. You got rear-ended by Vettel. So, and I, I remember you, you got on the radio and said something about this isn't a finishing school or bloody kids. I can yeah. see you launching your steering wheel there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I had food poisoning that day too. So I was actually vomiting in my helmet, which was quite a challenging Grand Prix for me to you know, concentrate uh, with some of the, the health challenges that I had going on for that particular race. And you're right. I mean, the conditions were feral. But if you look at – Lewis was actually, uh, without getting too technical and boring, but Lewis was um, – I think that they were using a slightly different brake material. He was trying to keep his brakes alive and doing this weird um, drop back from the safety car and sort of queuing people up. And I also pulled up beside Lewis and just sort of three quarters b- back to his th- third um, left-hand side there. And I said, like, mate, get close to the safety car it's dis it's, it's disappearing like we need to you know we need to sit behind this thing and just sort of have a bit and let this yo-yo effect is causing carnage behind and literally as i had done that i'm like got beside i'm like mate, you know and a, and a borderline as you know mate sometimes you can nearly get eye contact with it with a driver not in in those sort of conditions but you know he's clocked you next minute i had this like boom like absolutely <laughs> steamed on the uh, right and right up <laughs> the, the back end of my car and it was Sebastian who just miscued the whole thing, did 10-pin bowling behind the safety car. And I'm just like, that's what infuriated me. It's like, how do we have both cars? And at that time, mate, I mean, I know you had some success with Red Bull at Monaco, and, and but podiums were really, really flaky for us. They were like huge, huge opportunities. They were the days we needed to bank the big points um, and also our bank our big bonuses, DC, you know. So um, it was uh, – it was – I'm just like, how has Seb, Seb managed this? So I did have a meltdown that day, and, and I think he was um, – I know he was crying in the back of the garage, furious that, with himself because he you know, he was clearly to blame for that one. And um, But, yeah, frustrating, mate, that, you know, sometimes you can tread over your own you-know-what. Well, little did you know at that point that uh, he would end up being your teammate, and so starts one of the, the great rivalries of, of Formula One. Red Bull, continue the development, get a great car – uh, two great drivers in their prime. And uh, there was a few twists and turns along the way. But I, I think before we get into some of your more intimate moments uh, to, uh, that, that happened with Seb as teammates, we need to touch on your, your experience of flying. I mentioned that in uh, Le Mans with Mercedes, you had a situation where the car flipped and we, we, we don't have that footage to hand right now, but uh, it's readily available on the internet. Uh, but we do have the footage of you going for a little flip over the back of, I think it was Kovalainen in Valencia. Mm. And, uh, man, you walked away. How lucky was that? Yeah, absolutely. Like, this is, um, I've just pitted. I'm trying to win time. And, and Hakey and Hake really is, you know, sitting in the middle of the road. It was just a matter of seconds before I should have passed him. But I always felt that he was sometimes a bit desperate behind the wheel. And, fighting with people that maybe he he might not need to but anyway that was a miscue from my side that you know he was defending something that was going to happen a bit later on anyway literally two or three corners later but i did touch his right rear you know pretty heavily and just launched just how i hit the perfect sort of sweet spot unfortunately for 
the structural rigidity of his right rear corner to stay intact, which was then the launching ramp of his rear tyre on the bottom of my floor or front wing main plane, if you like, and then up she went. And I was just worried, mate. I was thinking, like, hang on, is there a bridge here? I can't quite, because when you get that high, you start thinking about stuff that might not be there, that is there. I'm not sure. Um, but I was just very conscious that I thought there was something over the track at some point, but that was further in the last sector. But I was extremely fortunate that the, the momentum actually saved me because clearly, as you know, mate, it's the stopping that really can bring the energy into the shunts. And I, I was, I, I landed the car right at itself somehow and got back on its, its the correct side. Obviously, not on all fours because they were being started to be torn off and, and the brake pedal pretty much went to the floor because I started to lose obviously all the, the fluids out of the brake lines and, and the rest of it. But, um, and then I was ready for the, ready for the hit, um, which was, which was pretty heavy, but I was already thinking about the points lost. Honestly, I was thinking about, yes, the gymnastics was impressive, but I was furious with the, with the points that I'd lost, um, in a situation where, um, there's a poor first lap. Poor first lap ultimately got me in that position. I had to do undercuts to get myself in. So it's, as you know, mate, it's always it manifests itself into a situation where I shouldn't have been and I was, and that's the end scenario. So very, very infuriating. There's so much in your career we could talk about, but we have to, to move on to later in that year. Your, your rivalry is really building with Sebastian. He's, you know, younger phase of his career. You're established and you have this incident in Turkey, which... I remember I was calling it from the commentary box and it looked to me that Sebastian, having got alongside you, then moved slightly to the right and that's where the contact came. But of course, he saw it another way and this was the first, I guess, warning to the team that they had a couple of you know, caged animals ready to go out and, and try and win this championship and it was going to be difficult to manage. Yeah, that's right. Um, there was a few subplots uh in in the background as you say in terms of qualifying runs who goes first who goes second sometimes there was uh you know some some breaches on that so um it was getting there was some tension building and i had won uh the previous two grand prix uh before turkey uh and i was on pole position on turkey and i was leading that race as well and and i think that early in the race what became very very clear is lewis was a handful you know we had to keep the mclarens behind us and i had done that for you know pretty much 80% of the Grand Prix. Lewis, we were very, very strong in the high-speed corners. Mercedes were very strong on the straights, but Lewis, ultimately, um, I had held him off for a long period of time. Now, I'm not saying it was a guaranteed victory, but it, Lewis had tried around the stops and we'd done all the right moves to, to have him in, in place. And then ultimately, with Lewis having a few goes at me strategy-wise, actually then it helped with Sebastian's strategy. Then he, um, I think the undercut or over something at the pit stop where he got in front of Lewis then, so I thought that was pretty much between the pair of us. It's not a formation finish, clearly, but we'd done a lot of the hard work. Um, but as it, as it turned out, because I'd led a big, big chunk of the Grand Prix, that the the way that the um, and here it is now, just running down to this little hairpin down there, and there's the little whack to the right, which um, sort of surprised me and said wanted to come back so aggressively, and we made contact, and he sort of rolled off the brake. So I think he was still aiming for me. He was still unfinished business in the gravel trap, still trying to hit me. But uh, um, and there's. Uh, there's the, the pit wall. And this, I think that that there, there really infuriated my mother. Can you believe it? My mum's like, my God, he can't do that about you, you know, saying you're crazy. But I said, mum, look, come on. Like, you know, it was 300K. There was a bit going on. But um, you see here, I think, so here, I think he actually rolled off the brakes and sniffed us. Where is he? Where is he? I'm still missing <laughs> there. So, uh, um, but, yeah, and there's Christian, obviously, absolutely livid in the whole team. And rightly so. I think um, it was, it was uh, crazy scenes. But, um, yeah, I managed to, Change my front wing and and continue on and and Seb left the track right there and um, helmet uh, Marco took a position so he nailed me in the press helmet was pretty pretty much against me and then I was sort of got out of the car and thought well what the hell's happened here so it was a tough to manage within the teammate and I think that at that time our relationship was starting to be stressed um, because it was hard to manage the dynamics of us the the, the pros and the strengths and weaknesses I suppose of us at that point. Um, and I was certainly believed I was on top of that car and driving it brilliantly, but um, they kept, I mean, the momentum, I suppose the energy in the team was was quite challenging for me. Um, so yeah, that just put fuel on the fire with the relationship. It then raises its head again later that year in Malaysia. And there was a strategy 
in the team where if they said multi 12, that meant car one in front of car two. And if they said multi 21, it said that car two in front of car one is my understanding. And the call came multi 21. And yet Seb raced you, almost had contact and then overtook you and went on to, to win that Grand Prix. And any relationship that you had as teammates at that time was pretty much finished, I, th I suppose, after that race. Yeah, that's right. I think we we knew again, you know, Lewis was very quick. Unsurprisingly, we were horrendous in our performance, build up and build up in the build up to the Grand Prix. We thought this is going to be a tough race for us to win. But yeah, it was a bizarre scene because obviously we, we, we were, you know, said one of my biggest regrets, I should have turned my engine right back up, mate, but I still didn't. Instinctively, I'm like, well, we should be just closing this race out. You know, we've only got three or four laps or whatever, it's five laps to go and, and we're fighting each other and, and using a lot of material and machinery because um, it was clear for that particular race that um, we should be shutting the Grand Prix down and we've done the job after the stops. And But that was a surprise, mate. And I think that even, I don't know, deep down, who knows if Sebastian still to this day sort of regrets that particular Grand Prix. Maybe he doesn't, I'm not sure. Um, but look, I wasn't, angel, I wasn't an angel at certain other events here and there. But that one, I think, was... If, mate, it just there's so many scenarios that brew to this point and this was just another another one that was then highly publicized obviously the radio was out um and i was on my way anyway and i'd made my decision to 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 pretty much retire because that was 2013 at that point so yeah uh, i was on my way you you see seb now at ferrari going through some some tricky times and you know what the journey of being young driver to to being in the sort of center of attention to then making the decision to move on. How do you see his particular journey right now? Well, he's in a challenging environment. I think that, you know, on, on top of his, I suppose, for the want of a better word, sort of fallout with, with Marinello that, 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 you know, Charles has arrived, he's performing very well. Sebastian had a tough year last year. Um, and I think that the, the time he's spent there um, has really, you know, worn him down and, and the results haven't been what he expected. He's openly said that he wanted to try and do something that Michael had done there and fly the flag, continue to fly that flag with, you know, in, in the tricky circumstances that Michael's in at the moment. So that was a personal, you know, mission for him. He's missed that target. Um, and, and then, as you say, someone arrives and, and starts to put the heat on the situation. I think Sebastian loved, absolutely loved the cars, you know, the, the sort of Pirelli cars with a narrow tyre, tricky on downforce. Um, and that was a really special generation uh, and regulation for him to show how, how much he enjoyed driving those cars. I'm not sure this type of generation of car is his, is his MO, a car that he really enjoys, because as you know, man, as a driver, you have to drive different types of, it's Formula One as a category, but we drive so many different types of cars within that. So I'm not making excuses for him, but I think that coupled with his age and, and, um, Kids at home now, where's your energy? Um, he's got lots and lots of questions in his head going around on 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 what he needs to do because a Max Verstappen, a Charles Leclerc, Lewis Hamilton, they don't have, you know, again, are they distractions? Are they, you know, where's your emotion towards your job Monday to Friday? Because Verstappen, those boys, they don't have that. They are there to win and they, they want to be um, focused on that job. So, um I don't know if he'll stop, mate. I don't know if he, if the racing point situation will happen. Um, you know that it'll be clearly, you know, it'll be on the back of the podium if he's lucky. You know that's and that you know how much will he enjoy that? Um, I'm not sure. So um, in a tricky situation, uh, and as you say, the greats, it happens. It happens fast. You know, you can go from it's a fine line uh, from being successful, well, you know, really successful, to then just being uh, one of the numbers in there. Yeah, well, you never quite managed to, to come away with the world title that you deserve, but um, you went pretty close. Uh, one of those particular well, years, of course, uh, where it maybe slipped away was at the Korean Grand Prix in, in the wet. And I know we've touched on that before, but w where do you set in your mind in terms of the journey you had in Formula One, the victories, the podiums, and the fact that you, you, you haven't picked up the ultimate trophy you know, in, in my mind's eye, and I'm not saying this because you're a buddy, then, you know, you've achieved more as a driver than some people who have won a championship in terms of your, your you know, different teams you've driven for and the performances and the speed that you've had. But maybe you can explain to us where it sits in your mind. Any regrets? Well, I think that naturally, and, and you'd be the same, mate, whether we, you, we're both hung out with the best of the best when it comes to sport, whether it's 
tennis or rugby union or boxing or golf, or whatever. I mean, naturally, most people stop and there is something they they would like to have had a little bit more. That's in our instinct to always continue to push the boundaries and, and have, have done things, you know, maybe a bit differently and, and, and have a, a, a slightly different um, trophy cabinet for different reasons. But I think that, you know, if we go back to the start of this chat, which is, you know, where we grew up and I know the same for you, mate, in Twynham and myself in, in, uh, in Queen Bean, and you're like, well, I just want to, if I can do a Grand Prix, you know, then you do a Grand Prix and then you get a world championship point, which as we know, mate, back in our day, they were real points, top six, real stuff, you know, <laughs> not handing them out like the back of cornflakes packets now, you know. So they were, you know, they were tough to get and then you get a point and then it's like I've got a podium and then it's like, you know, and you, know, you and I are sitting here, you know, from those little villages, mate, with a 100 podiums between us. Um, and it's not about, you know, us two banging on about each other, but it's like it's, it's perspective, I think. It gives you perspective and you look back and you're like, well, Yes, you always want more. Instinctively, you know, if I did this and if I did that, you know, I look at my, you know, there's probably two or three starts that probably cost me a world championship. You can say Korea did, but there was two or three starts where I'm out of position. I had to fight back through in that particular year. Um, I could be sitting here, you know, as, as a world champion, but I'm not because I didn't finish that season with enough points. I did take it to the last race against Hamilton, against Alonso, against Vettel. Um, and Sebastian only led the championship of one race that year, which was the last bloody race. Unbelievable. Can you believe that? So um, I believe I did everything I could, mate. I, I really, really invested a lot of my time and energy and effort into trying to get the maximum out of that particular season. Um, so regrets, you know, I'd like to have a better reaction time. You were phenomenal at starts, mate. I was, I was subpar. Now, that was something which, you know, what else could I have worked on to get that better? I tried my best. Um, so, yeah, you, you've got this contradiction of, of accepting and the clarity of, yes, it's been an amazing journey. The people we work with, the trophies, the experience is unbelievable. What, what, what I have, what we have is, is special. And then you're like, just a bit more, just a little bit more. It's natural, you know, like... I'd like to be off nine wins, then have ten. Why don't I round it out to ten wins? And, but I've got, you know, and then you, someone pointed out to me the other day, you've got the same amount of fastest left as Ant and Senna. Never knew that. Never knew that. But it's like, wow, how is that possible? You know, but bizarre. But You, you know, it always seemed to me that there, there was an element of you that, that thrived on, on, you know, being slightly back against the wall or doing something that somebody said you weren't allowed to do. And, of course, you know, you weren't supposed to take your helmet off and the slowing down. Line. <laughs> you were like, it's my last yeah. Grand Prix. I'm going to celebrate this, you know, like Senna would have done or like some of the legends of the sport would have done. And uh, so we've got some great imagery of, of that moment. But of course, you'd already at that, on that slowing down lap at your last Grand Prix, you'd committed your future to Porsche and the World Sports Car Programme, of which you did pick up the ultimate trophy. So is that trophy behind in the cabinet there? Uh, it's not actually, mate. No, it's um, it's uh, it's in Australia. But uh, yeah, the Brazil moment was, mate. Really, I think because being a sports fan, and you know, you know this as well as I do, mate. That you know, we always compete with our helmets on, and, and that was just really a thank you to 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 the fans. To I mean, Brazil, I won that Grand Prix twice, so I felt that I had a great affinity with 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 that. Um, I got off to a bad start, mind you. In 2002, I took Felipe Massa out, and I think I needed to get a bloody escort out of that place because they were pretty furious with me. But um, uh, so my relationship with the locals uh, in Brazil certainly improved with, with some of the wins there. But um, I always enjoyed competing in Interlagos. It was a nice way to finish. Again, I had a little faster slap there. I was on the podium with, with Fernando and Seb. So to finish my last Grand Prix um, in you know, in, 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 in sort of good style, let's say, uh, and as a, as a thank you. And, that, and there is there is a human component behind us drivers. That was the thank you. The hu We are in here. We are human. We do our best and, and, and sort of a thank you uh, both ways. So, um, and then, as you say, the Porsche time, mate, was, was great fun, sports cars. I think at that point in my career, being a bit older, I was a bit more less selfish and enjoyed helping, you know, the not the whole team, but in terms of drivers because you have to share – the balance and, and, and make sure that you all get on tremendously well, that the journey of your performance is linked heavily to theirs. So um, being an older dog for that situation, I was much more inclined to, to, to be that way, which was which is really rewarding and engaging. So, and a great brand, obviously, Porsche have been tremendous and I'm still with them to this day. Um, so yeah, had good times with them as well. Yeah, no, the time flies, doesn't it? It's, uh, it's incredible how, um, sport sucks you in. You dedicate your 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 life, your energy, 
and then you step out the other side and think, well, that was fun. Um, but we, we still got a, a few years ahead of us. Um, I'm proud to call you a friend, Mark, and we get to work together on the, the Channel 4 broadcast of Formula One. So I'm looking forward to standing shoulder to shoulder with you to do some more commentary on these young pups and yeah. commenting on how we wouldn't have done it that way and <laughs> we never made any mistakes. Of course, of course not. We were perfect, mate. We were angels. We were angels, buddy. Yeah. No, it's been a blast, mate. And um, yeah, thanks to Heineken. Uh, the weekend off, obviously, uh, unscripted. It's been, um, are we going to have a little brew, mate? Or Well, I'm glad you mentioned it because we, we've talked a bit longer than maybe would have been uh, required, but the reward is we get to do a little cheers. Yes. So, Mark, it's been a pleasure. Cheers. Well done.